And now it's time for the 2023 Knocker Awards. Here are your hosts, two guys that have made us wait long enough. What do you say, fellas? 2024, the year of the JC Nestlemania Brian Panties match. Give it up for JC and Nestlemania. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for everybody's favorite wrestling award show of the year. It is officially the 2023 Knock Awards. Of course, I'm Nestle Mania. Alongside is for the ride is the man that puts these categories together with alongside TJ, JC. It is the uh, most wonderful time of the year. You know, we bookend kind of our two favorite shows, uh, beginning of the year and end of the year, with our Rumble Hopes coming next month. But we end the year with the lovely Knocker Awards, where we each give out a golden knocker. And you know what happens, Nestlemania? When you take one knocker and you put another knocker next to it, you get two. So two knockers per <laughs> category here. If you're on the video, you just got a little treat there. But yeah, Nestlemania, I'm ready to go. It's knocker season. We have a ton of good categories. So with that said, JC, we always ask for our dear friend, Michael mm. Downing, to lead into this with great poise and lend his great pipes for all these categories. And Michael is here again this year. And Michael, let's start off in the shine categories. Super hot fire moment of the year. CM Punk returns to WWE at Survivor Series. Jey Uso pins Roman Reigns at Money in the Bank. Sami Zayn hits Roman Reigns with the chair at the Royal Rumble. Soraya wins the AEW Women's title at All in London. Super hot fire moment of the year. You heard Michael just list off. We had some great moments this year in WrestleMania. Actually, when TJ and I were like, the, you know, we throw together the list throughout the year, we had about eight moments. So we obviously had to do some deleting, but the four that uh, Michael just read off for uh, you, everyone here is that they're definitely the top four. And for me, I definitely have a heavy lean. Um, and it's probably the most recent one to me because it has literally been something we've been anticipating for a decade. And that is Mr. CM Punk returning at Survivor Series. But I am curious your take before I finalize my uh, position, because obviously we had some very big bloodline moments earlier in the year when it was red hot. Sami Zayn obviously returning on him at the Rumble with the chair. That was that was such an awesome moment. It was something we were anticipating. It was so cool to see. And then his buddy, Jey Uso, who wasn't his buddy, but was his buddy, getting the pin on Roman Reigns, the first man to pin Roman Reigns since Corbin. Um, so it, it obviously wasn't a singles match. It was a tag match, but still a big deal. And then obviously our girl Soraya completed her comeback story by winning the AW Women's Championship at All In London. That was a great moment, too. I love to see it. But for me, I think it came down to Punk and probably Sammy, but I'm curious your take. So I really do love, uh, you know, Paige, as we say, Soraya, we love her here on the program, but I don't think it really is in the same stratosphere as some of these other ones. Uh, she's definitely, I don't want to, you know, backtrack and say she's not worth it. She definitely is. But I think these other were kind of just like, you will remember this for the rest of your life kind of stuff. Um, I would think Jay Uso pinning Roman Reigns is a big moment for the bloodline. But I don't think it's the best bloodline moment. I think it comes mm -hmm. down to Sami Zayn and that chair shot and the ruckus crowd of just that reaction is just so huge and it will stick out in your minds as probably the best storyline of the modern era. And that was a crucial moment in that in that whole thing and led off to so many amazing moments before and after and all that stuff. CM Punk, we never thought we were going to see it. Uh, he comes back in Survivor Series in Chicago and the whole world, the blaze, you know, hell is frozen over for me as much as I do not enjoy Phil Brooks, the person, I think that 10 years in the making makes it the scorching super hot fire moment of the year. I'm giving my knocker. You're going to see a trend this year. I think with Phil Brooks, CM Punk getting the super hot moment of the year, super hot fire moment of the year. Excuse me. Hey, uh, get it right. God sakes you're you're botching the gimmick Super hot fire moment of the year goes there you go to, he goes to cm punk at returning to survivor series and the wwe because we're off to the races folks yeah and you did nothing to dissuade me there you actually picked the one that i was leaning towards so my golden knocker is also going to cm punk's return because look at i i love trashing on cm punk his whole career it's one of those things like i've always appreciated him but just like 
this whole like journey of him getting back to WWE, it's just like, it's like a longer form and a very obviously different version than Cody's, but stuff like that I find so fascinating because you get the overlap of real life and character and it just, it's a perfect melding. And I look forward to see what 2024 has for CM Punk, but he ends 2023 with the jobber knockers, super hot fire moment of the year. Best story. Drew McIntyre is angry. The friendship of MJF and Adam Cole. Sami Zayn and the Bloodline. Uso's emancipation from the Bloodline. Well, there you have it from Michael. Best story, folks. And you know what? We talk about it all the time here in the Jobber Knocker. Wrestling's great, but what drives television and pay-per-views, PLEs, is the story. And we've got the best four nominations here. There's a lot to choose from, a lot of meat on the bone, as we say. But uh, I'm curious. Yeah, there you go. JC's hashtag. No, sorry, I'm not even going to bother. I'm not even going to bother. The it's meat, not a meat story guy. of the year. The meat story of the year. Oh, man. Gotta love the filet mignon story of the year. Um, anyway, so look, there's a lot going on here, right? We, we know that when it comes to the story, the bloodline is front and center, right? Mm-hmm. That is the most story-centric thing we've ever seen. So there is the Usos emancipation. We know that Sami Zayn and the bloodline in general was amazing. MJF and Adam Cole's friendship was good too. But Drew McIntyre, folks, although end of the year is very interesting to me. It's since like, what do we think? September? It's been happening. Maybe I, it, it feels like relatively kind of just happening, but it, it's so potent and I'm, I'm such, I'm loving it. I'm kind of leaning towards it, JC. What do you think? I think you might have a little bit of recency bias here. And this one, it's a tough one to have because if we look at all these nominations, they're all kind of flawed in terms of timeline because obviously the Grouchy Drew thing is still ongoing. Um, The Sami Zayn and the Bloodline, a lot of it happened in 2022. We just got the massive payoffs at the beginning of 2023 and that led through eventually. And then obviously like the spring and summer was kind of the, uh, the pickup was the Usos emancipating themselves from it. We've seen Jay just put himself on this whole other level. Jimmy's kind of regressed which just kind of soured that one for me a little bit. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's going to get it. And then the MJF and Adam Cole friendship was just AEW caught lightning in a bottle with, they had this stupid fucking tournament with random tag teams and they just, they literally caught it and they were running with it. And then you just had unfortunate things kind of happen, but that storyline is still fully like not over. Cause obviously that's like intermingled with other things and we'll see what 2024 holds. So a lot of the times when we get to this category, I feel like there's always one that played out completely in the year and that stands out. But this year, it just, I mean, I think it's not a bad thing that all these long-term stories are kind of bleeding around. But yeah, I don't I don't think Grouchy Drew is going to win it for me. Honestly, for me, I think it's the like penultimate stuff of Sami Zayn and the bloodline versus that like hot fire, like few months MJF and Adam Cole had right away. But I could be convinced. So I'm curious uh, what else you have to say here. Well, as you just said all those things, I, maybe it's just because I'm so excited about Drew McIntyre doing something, and I still have lost my bet, so I'm waiting on my T-shirt, apparently. That's Ooh. beside the point. I Don't keep make it in. That's okay. 2024, I'm, maybe I'll remember. No, you won't. That's okay. You'll come back in 2025 or something, I'm sure. Um, it's it's hard for me, because when you look at the... You can't say the bloodline in one or the other. They kind of meld together. But the Usos, to me, was important, very important, but it doesn't happen without Sami Zayn. So I feel like Sami Zayn takes the Usos out of it, right? Like as just much like as the it, last category, right? It just the the Sami Zayn is like the catalyst, the domino for everything. Uh, that man might be half Arabic and half Canadian and whatever, but goddamn, is he just amazing? A hundred percent, just amazing. He's a hundred percent Usi. I can tell you that he's a hundred percent Usi. But man, it is it's tough because I'm looking at this and I think you've you've swayed me, but with the MJF, Adam Cole, and 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 uh, Sami Zayn stuff. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Okay. I'm going to pick MJF and Adam Cole. Mm. Because here's my logic with this, right? Grouchy Drew, you 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 made a good point saying that it's still ongoing and it's still in its infancy, right? We were waiting for it to can really contribute here. Um, so I, I have to not do that. They, like we said, Sammy is more important than the Usos, in my opinion, in terms of the storytelling. So that's where Sammy is. So it's down to MJF and Sammy. However, the real problem I have is the payoff with Sammy and the bloodline. When we get to the, when we get to the tag titles, boom, WrestleMania, big moment. After that, it just fell, fell off the face of the earth for me. And I thought that tag team was just trash. 
across the board. I think Adam Cole, even, even with a broken ankle and foot, has still contributed to the story in a way that I'm still interested. And that happened in what, like July, August, September? Yeah, whenever they did that dumbass it, tournament. <laughs> but it's just like, it, it was, because remember All Out in, in August was where they met in the main event, which is a huge deal. So I'm going to say based on the brochachos and the bromance and the whole thing, and 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 MJF being the unlikely baby face in this entire thing, mm-hmm. that is that is very interesting to me. So I'm going to give MJF and Adam Cole my golden knocker for best story of the year. Yeah, we might have agreement on this one because the more you talked about, the more I thought of like the one of the few positive things in AW has just been this renaissance with MJF, and it doesn't happen without this storyline and – yeah, I mean the Sami Zayn, the bloodline thing, it was it was so incredible, but it really was a 2022, 2023 story. And like you said, we felt like it maybe ended a little flat. Um, but but yeah, no, I, I'm also gonna give it to MJF and M. Cole. Oh my god, first two categories were green, but you know what? It happens sometimes, WrestleMania. So MJF and Adam Cole, MJF could be uh, picking up a lot of knockers tonight, but he's getting two right now. Rivalry of the year. Adam Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland. Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov. Christian Cage and Fatherless Wrestlers. Cody Rhodes and Brock Lesnar. Hey, you. What you doing? Some people would call us rivals sometimes, WrestleMania. Some of us. About the rivalry. I'm like the Yankees. You're like the Red Sox. They kick the shit out of you most of the time. So is it really a rivalry? Of course it is. But, you know, (laughs) some of us just win. Some of us just lose. Uh, Winners over here. Losers over there. But WrestleMania, we had a lot of winners and rivalries this year. This is another category. It was jam-packed with stuff. There was a lot of good stuff. All the shows have someone pretty much uh, represented here. uh, Two from AEW. But this was a strong category uh, in terms of in rain, out of the rain, everything. And it was it's a tough one to decide. Um, but I will say two of them kind of stand up. Oh man, it's hard though. Cause there's three that are so good. Pretty much for me, I'm not giving it to mellow and dragon off. Um, I think wow. they're in rain. Okay. Their in rain was probably the best in rain rivalry of the year. And their story obviously is still ongoing and tricks a part of that. But to me, I think tricks been such an integral part of their rivalry. It's less about them two, um, on their own. Whereas I look at the other ones, I mean, look at like Hayman and Swerve had an all-timer in terms of violence and the type of the bar they set violence-wise and with going to the house and the fucking stapling the paintings to the head. Like, that's that's a real one. Obviously, Cody and Brock was fucking phenomenal. It picked up right after WrestleMania with the nonsense with the tag match and Brock turning on him and carried on. They had a bunch of great matches. It was a great feud. Brock looked like he was having a blast. So I really enjoyed that. But to me, WrestleMania, I think I'm giving my golden knocker to Christian Cage and fatherless wrestlers because this motherfucker just changed the game in terms of heel work in 2023. Spoiler alert for later, potentially. But this was just something where every week... It was so uncomfortably good television. It just like I was enthralled by it. The promos he would cut and how he would just all his victims. You could see them coming. Oh, my God. He has a dead dad. Christian's going after him. So it just like it was like just insane. And it it was it's something like at first I was going to put this in as a joke. But the more I thought of it, I'm like, man, you know what? This might be the rivalry of the year. So unless if you can convince me here, like I said, I, I loved all four of these rivalries, but Christian Cage and fatherless wrestlers, that's a rivalry if I've ever seen one. So I disagree wholeheartedly with you, and I'll tell you why. Because to me, well, you know, that's what one person's opinion is, but that's fine. I'll just tip my cap and call you my daddy. Um, you said, uh, well, rivalry, Red Sox, never mind. Anyway, it's a whole thing. Uh, yeah, um, okay. yeah, stay on track, would you? It was a Pedro reference. Um, anyway... When you say rivalry, to me, it's two entities, two people, two tag teams. Christian versus an entire realm of people, to me, isn't a rivalry. It's a, it's a typecast. It's, no, it's no. Like, it's, it's like, no, I don't want to use a no. bad example, but it's like it's like one person versus an entire group of people. You were going to say you were gonna say Adolf Hitler is what you were going to say. I was going to say Hitler versus the Jews, which obviously is not, not PC, but it's just like, that was a, that's like, that's what Christian is doing. He is a big, evil, bad guy, and he's going after one type of people. I'm just saying it's not a rivalry. It it's is a rivalry. No, it's not. It is. Well, a, I, I don't know. A, I'm looking at the category a, here. One, two, three, four. It's listed rivalry. It's not. I think this is an erroneous, yeah. erroneous an nomination. Erroneous, erroneous nomination. Erroneous. Well, that's up for debate. That's fine. But what I'm telling you right now is it is off of my list for the Golden Knockers because of that alone. Because it's stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. 
I'm going to say right here, Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov, amazing in-ring work, as you stated. I didn't necessarily love the extra accoutrements as the feud went on. That's not the strongest one for me. It comes down to Hangman Adam Page versus, you know, Swerve and Cody Rhodes and Brock Lesnar. So this is a doozy for me, a doozy, a twosie of a doozy. A doozy My of a doozy is how it actually goes. A doozy of a twosie. Sorry, JD. Uh, so look, I've had a lot of shit in my life today. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's behind the scenes. Reach out and grab that shit, baby. <laughs> yeah, great. It's all over my walls. Uh, no, look, I, I really, 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 really love rivalries. What am I going to remember for the rest of my life? When I think of a rivalry, I think of Brett and Owen, you know, I think of Hogan warrior, Austin rock. Triple H, Mankind, you can think you can go on and on, you know, Rock, everybody, Rock, Cena, whatever. What's going to stand the test of time in my mind? To me, the visual of Swerve and Hangman bleeding is going to be in my mind for the rest of my life. Now, at the end of Cody and Brock, that handshake and hug and the hand raising, that at the end of it will stand the test of time for me. It's tough. Because they both have monumental moments. But I'm going to go with Hangman Adam Page and Swerve getting my golden knocker. Because I like the uncomfortableness of going into the house. All the extra stuff with Prince Nana. Everything up into it. And it made they made so many barbs with the you're getting fat and lazy. And I'm going to take your spot and be the first black champion. It just felt cool to me. And it's something that not that Cody Rhodes and Brock Lesnar were handcuffed because they certainly weren't, but I feel like Cody would have loved to have blood and Brock would have, would have loved it too. And that would have made it a blood rivalry. So I feel like blood wins out overall. Okay, Moxley. Okay, Moxley. They didn't yeah. need that was the thing. Cody yeah. and Brock was that without blood. They didn't need to draw finger paintings on their fucking forehead. Let me pick you. Let me guess you pick Cody. No, I told you I'm picking Christian Cage and Fatherless Wrestlers. Erroneous. The that worst is the rivalry. Pick of, that is the 2023 rivalry. That is the of dumbest the year. pick of that the year. That is the one that I will remember forever. The patriarchy. Christian Cage set the tone. These are all these are all good nominees, but this one stands ahead above the rest because you know what? Yeah. I see it all, baby. On that note, from one father to another, let's ask Michael for the next category. Male Superstar of the Year, Cody Rhodes, Gunther, MJF, Will Ospreay. Well, we all know that JC loves Male Superstars of the Year, but I'm going to go off and into a tangent here and say that uh, I don't have to waste any more time and say he's going to pick Cody. Maybe. No, there's Am no, I, there's, there's there's no many. There, there are There are three, like, top of the line JC guys on this list. And like, you are... Uh, and you another are guy. underestimating my love for Will Ospreay. Obviously, MJF. He's the quintessential guy that JC would love. And then, I mean, I, I mean, I love the hell out of Gunther. There's no denying the year he had. So these are four incredible, incredible nominees. But yeah, I'm picking Cody Rhodes. There you go. I, this man won the Royal Rumble. He made it to WrestleMania. Lost. He had the moment. He had one of the super, one of the fucking rivalries of the year with Brock Lesnar. No, Lester. he didn't. No matter what, he, he did have one of them. It was just nominated. He had one of the rivalries of the year Stupid. you're an idiot you're an idiot you you literally the way you just went through it he had the best rivalry in wwe in 2023 because it was your runner-up to an aw team so you are erroneous you are a moron but it's cody the answer is always cody because everything cody does people pays attention cody's the draw cody's the superstar cody's the one that everyone wants to see cody's selling out arenas cody's got the best entrance in the game cody's got the best presence in the game cody's doing the most appearances cody's doesn't fucking lose matches ever except for the roman reigns in the main event of wrestlemania hopefully that's changing in 2024 but yeah the superstar of the year, it's Cody Rhodes. Number two, I'm giving it to MJF, but Cody Rhodes is number one. He is a superstar of the year. And if all goes as planned, he'll be superstar of the year next year as well. I couldn't hear you with his junk in your mouth. I just, I, I mean, if he, had, if his junk was in my mouth, you would never see me again. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be a happy second wife to Brandy. I can't, I can't birth his kids, but I can help him raise them. I don't know what to say. Cody Rhodes gets my golden knocker at the end. Wow. Michael, that was easy. <laughs> 
Female Superstar of the Year. Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Rhea Ripley, Tony Storm. Well, WrestleMania, we just picked our male superstar of the year. Now we got to pick our female superstar of the year because uh, we have a bunch of amazingly dominant women, as Michael just spelled out. Some are timeless. Some are powerhouses. Some are on their own. I guess the wall. That sounds a banner. And also some people actually call the man, but this is a female superstar of the year award. But a man is nominated. This is this is insane. But yeah, WrestleMania. This was an interesting, uh, an interesting year because obviously we've had some dominant women's champions. Um, both shows and AEW's kind of had like a fucking hot potato going on where it's just I think Tony could have been like a three-time champion this year. I don't even know. I know she has been a multi-time champion. Soraya had it for a hot minute. Um, so that one's been kind of all over the place. And you know, Tony's really had a strong finish, but I can't ignore her first like eight to nine months of the year. So for me, she's a distant fourth behind wow. um, yeah, behind the uh the three WWE women. Um to me, this is really a two horse race. Bianca, obviously, she probably got my award last year. She was very dominant for the first half of this year. Obviously, it kind of tilled off a little. She took some time off. Um, she's one of their biggest draws, but she's three for me. To me, it came down to Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch. And they're obviously both on Raw. So it's impressive that two women from Raw can be nominated for this. But obviously, like, I feel like the critique with Rhea is obviously the in rain. She really didn't have a ton of competition. But to me, and the reason why she's going to get my golden knocker slightly, ever so slightly over Becky, because Becky had an amazing year, and we'll get on more on her in a minute. Uh, but for Rhea, it's just like she was kind of the focal point of like the main thing on that show, which we never see as a woman. Like she was leading pretty much an all male faction besides herself. She was larger than life character. She's someone that gets a reaction from the crowd um, no matter what. Her stuff with Dom has been fucking A plus shit. Anytime she interacts with Priest or Finn or anyone else or the showdown she's had with like the stare downs with Solo and other men on the roster, it just, she feels like she's on a different level than everyone else. Obviously her and Becky haven't crossed paths. We're probably in for that in 2024. But to me, it's just, I have to pick Rhea. And I understand that in rain, when she was in the rain, I think she had great matches, but I understand that the competition didn't feel like it was there. But I think part of that is because she was just so dominant that there just there was no competition. And that's enough for me to give her my golden knocker. It hurts me to say that you're right in a lot of ways on this one. But it's true. So I'll say it. Okay. Tony Tony uh, Tony Storm pre uh timeless Tony was dog shit. She would not have been on that list. Not on the list. If, it timeless. <laughs> if it wasn't for timeless Tony Storm, she wouldn't be on the list. So yes. I I agree that she's not. When I think of superstars, I think Bianca Belair. But like you said, was in and out, gone for a while, got cashed in on the whole thing. Like she hasn't been the focal point of the show. Becky Lynch was the focal point of two shows, though. Agreed. And she had a hell of a run in NXT. I and agree. she's been doing something that Rhea Ripley didn't do, which mm-hmm. was really showing her wrestling and showing off the future in NXT, which I thought was, you know, a tip of the cap and making, and not only that, but dragging these women out of the locker room who weren't getting TV time. 100%. That's a superstar. That is a superstar. So I'm conflicted, JC. Do I go with somebody that I know can't hit a leg drop, but did a lot of good? Or do I go (laughs) against somebody that she was the main focal point of the year, but it just fucking beat tomato cans. I I feel like it's just a little bit of nothing in both, but also a lot in, in, in the same ways. I'm conflicted. Well, you I'm can't gonna... give a tie. You got to pick one. And like I said, this was a very slight edge for me. Very slight. So I'm not going to fault you whichever way you go. I'm going to go with Rhea. Because... Of course you are. You're a Brit shamer. Yes, that's exactly it. I like the Aussies instead. That's exactly Aussie, it. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. All right, all right, all right. Oh, oh, category early, sorry. <laughs> Tag Team of the Year, The Acclaimed, Aussie Open, FTR, Judgment Day. Well, Michael, thank you for the nominees, but we do have kind of a conundrum here, JC. Tag Team Wrestling in 2023. You're going to leave me hanging? We're a fucking tag team and you're going to leave me hanging? Hot tag. Idiot. (laughs) I was milking it. We're the baby faces. Come on. Michael Gennetti. That would hurt if it wasn't true. 
I better go tell everybody that MJ's in town. You, you, never mind. That's a whole other point. Um, God damn it. So these tag teams, this was a rough year for tag teams in my yeah. opinion. And it felt like AW has the best tag team division, but we didn't see it this year. It felt like the unified tag titles were just kind of like non-existent and kind of like not important and kind of handcuffing the rest of the tag team division. And I can't think of anything. So as we're looking at this, I see the acclaimed. Everybody loves the acclaimed. Everybody loves the acclaimed. But it, but but do I love them enough to give them my knocker? No, no, I don't. We I had don't. To, we had to even four in the category. Yeah, I know, I know. Quasi <laughs> open. R O R O H. Oi oi oi. Yeah. <laughs> they they won the R O H tag titles. So that's that's at least they won something. They had some banners this year before one, uh, the yeah. other dude. The guy I don't know his name got hurt. The Fletcher? non no, not Kyle charismatic Fletcher. one. Yeah. Kyle Fletcher's the charismatic one. I, I've been told that I, I would one. tell that I have the Kyle Fletcher haircut. You kind of do. So it's I, super douchey, but that's why it works for him. So, but not me. giving off a little little douche charm. You don't like my ascot? Is that not another thing? I mean, I've noticed it, but I haven't commented on it. I mean, it freaking has to print over here. Has to which print. is Scarlet oh. Letta. Anyway, uh, FTR always a big, uh, big, you know. Big deal in the tag team division and Judgment Day because they've had it like 600 times. <laughs> and they were better than KO and Sammy, just barely. They were. So they, they, got were. The nom. they got the nomination. Doesn't mean they're good at it. Yeah. I don't necessarily. So to me, it's like a two-horse race. Ozzy Open and FTR. That's what I look at. Where are you in this? Same. Where well, I'm exactly the same. But for me, this is an easy one. It's FTR. Because it's just when I look at tag teams in 2023, FTR did what they were supposed to do. They had banner matches. They fought everyone. They are over with the crowd. They had great promos. They were champions for a long amount of time. Um, they did what they were supposed to do. The problem is nobody else in this category did. So they're getting it by default. Aussie Open, great breakout tag team. Some great matches, especially with FTR. But they're not a tag team of the year yet. Hell, they might not even be a tag team anymore with how well Kyle Fletcher's been doing on his own. He just won a singles title. And then obviously Judgment Day is just... They're like, they're fine. Priest and Finn are fine for a thrown together tag team. It works, but they're not a tag team of the year. And then uh, the acclaimed, they're a trio now. And they're awesome. I love them. They're great. They're amazing. They've had a great year. But again, it's it's FTR and everyone else this year because the Usos broke up. New Day's been injured. The Young Bucks are doing God knows what. Uh, Penta and uh, and uh, what's his name? Phoenix have been hurt off and on and been hanging out in Reign of Honor. So we're talking about all these great world-class tag teams that haven't really been involved. So this was an easy one. Give me FTR. I will also go with Forever the Revival because I think they deserve it. And uh, quite frankly, I think they'd beat me up if I didn't give it to them. So I'm going to give them my golden knocker. They get a pair. They get a set of knockers this year. Good for them. They look like some boys that love them knockers. Best champion. Christian Cage. Gunther. Orange Cassidy. Wes Lee. Ain't no way they can stop me now, Nelly, because I'm on my way. I can see my rain coming. It's the heart of a champion, baby. And we had some great ones in 2023. Like, legit, long-term, dominant, Banner matches, championship reigns. So many that we couldn't even put them all on this list. Like, it's crazy. Like, MJF's been the champion the whole year. For the most part, done a good job. Is he on this list? No, I don't see him, WrestleMania, because the AW representative is the TNT champion. Stud, Christian Cage. But he's not getting my golden knocker in this. There's two AW representatives. Oh, yeah, that's right. Orange Cassie's don't, international championship. Don't, don't dis. Which, you know, Ness, I will say this. If the year ended two months ago, that would have been a runaway winner for me because his reign was fucking special and amazing. Then Moxley beat him, gave it up to, was it Phoenix? Phoenix, Phoenix, because he Phoenix won it. And then Cassie just won it back, and he's just kind of, you know, doing useless matches now since he's been back. Uh, Wesley had a kind of a parallel thing going on with him, but in NXT with the North American title, they were both doing the same thing. They'd come out, they'd have a banner match every week. They both improved so much character-wise. They became two of my favorite baby faces on each of their shows. But it just, they just, those ended. You know what I mean? And they were great, and I appreciate them for what they were. But, like, Gunther's just hasn't ended. And when I look at Gunther's, we had this issue when we were kind of coming up with matches. Every single match that Gunther's in is good. It's kind of like how Roman Reigns has been the last few years. Like, every match he does is good, so it's hard to pick one over the other. But with Gunther, there's been that consistency. But he started the year 2023 
in a fucking dominant way as the Intercontinental Champion in the Royal Rumble, going the distance, coming up just short to Cody. And then he obviously goes on WrestleMania, has that banner of a triple threat with Drew and Sheamus. And then it was just match after match throughout the year. His character performing, I think the audience growing more respect and resentment for him at the same time. Him continuing to bring Ludwig and Vinci up with them. So especially Ludwig, we saw kind of like flutter his own wings. So for me, I'm giving Gunther in the Intercontinental Championship um, my best champion of 2023 because it was there from start to finish. There weren't any weak points. And it's crazy, man, because this thing is could be going well into 2024 as well. You do realize as of right now, he's like in February... After the Elimination Chamber, he will be the accumulative combined number of days champion as well. It's insane. That, this reign yeah, is insane. insane. It's insane. Um, as I'm looking at this, I love Wesley. Give me Wesley every day of the week. But like you said, there's Get been a portion, soon, of, there's a portion of the year where he has not been uh, you know, the champion. So I will solidify myself saying when I think of that championship, I will think of him. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. there are other people like this. Like you said, if Moxley didn't intervene with uh, OC, Orange Cassidy would have got my nod, right? So to me, it's a two horse race. It's Christian and it's Gunther. Interesting. Because I look at it from this Gunther, you made a great case for, I'm not going to, you know, overdub what you just said, but Christian took something that in all tense and purpose wasn't really special. Yep. And then made it special. Dare I say, cause he said it and it might be true. It's the best championship on that show. Not wrong. So you look at it that way, it's highlighted pay-per-views. Now, did Gunther headline a pay-per-view? With no, that but WWE is a different animal. I'm just they saying. they have like nine world titles. I'm just saying. I'm just AW saying. AW only has one. I'm just saying. Well, that's not true. They have Ring of Honor. That doesn't count. They've got international. They've got the continental. Yeah, but those aren't world titles. WWE, titles. WWE has two men's world titles and two women's world titles. So it's a lot tougher to get a mid-card title up there. And Christian, especially with Collision, like you mentioned, has made that TNT fight have a world title feel. Like it feels like a main event title, right? Especially when MJF has been fucking off doing other shit. Christian's been the dominant champion, so you're bringing up a lot of good points. Maybe I'm I should go- on my list. I'm going to give my golden knocker to the Patriarch. I'm. I, I think Christian Cage. I, and when I think of champion, I look. I look. I look. And I see somebody that delivers on all cylinders, and that would be my only caveat with Gunther up until recently with the Miz. He hasn't hit that next gear. He's been doing phenomenal in the ring, but in terms of the performance and the the, the accoutrement of entertainment that you need, Christian has that in spades. What? Duh. Christian's the best. I mean, this this feels like a makeup award because you fucked up rivalry. No, that's what it feels like. No, to me. no, no. Michael, no. move on before he can retort. Best brand: AEW Collision, AEW Dynamite. NXT, Raw, SmackDown. Branding is important. And as Michael just discussed, there's one, two, three, four, five in this category, JC? Yeah, I mean, five. it's one of those things. It's it's kind of unfair to stick the two AEW shows together. I don't know if it's unfair for them or unfair for other shows, as in they're better or worse. But it just, they've become two separate entities, so they got to be on the list separately. But you left out Rampage. We also left out main event, and I think those are pretty fucking mirrored right there. <laughs> okay. I, I Don't tell Dom I said that, Dom. Close your ears. I know he loves Rampage. I can't shit on AW Dark anymore, so I got to shit on Rampage. <laughs> dark. Dark. Um, look, so there's a lot to get through here. Collision was really awesome, and, and it didn't really have anything going until I think it started in August or something, right? It felt like it was right when CM Punk came back and in that summertime of punk. Yep. And it has the best song. Saturday, 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 Saturday. Saturday. Wow. I never realized how much I have like a giraffe neck when I do this. (laughs) It it helps when you have fucking a tide. So it protrudes it more. Protruding. Uh, Your name would be Gertrude. If uh, that's something like a Gertrude would wear. I'm sure someone else will call me Billie Jean King in no time if he was in the chat. So it's fine. Uh, (laughs) Dynamite, which is the staple, whatever. And then NXT raw and SmackDown obviously have been around for a while. So, when I look at this, I think Collision would have been important had it been here year round. It was built around CM Punk, but after CM Punk left, it feels like it's floundering. So definitely not the best brand for me. Dynamite has been in shambles the last year. They will not get my vote. 
it comes down to WWE properties here, I think. And uh, you've you've said a lot about you know nice things about NXT and the best booker of the year, uh, HBK. He is just a That's sexy. Not opinion. He's not just a sexy boy. Yeah, he's a booker. He's a sexy too. booker. He's a sexy booker. Yes. Uh, Raw and SmackDown. Now it's weird. I can teeter totter, right? Like there were points where SmackDown was can't miss, and then there were points where Raw can't miss, right? But there wasn't a consistency. I'm looking for consistency in my branding. Was Raw the flagship all year round? I don't think so. Was SmackDown sometimes, but not enough. I will say this. NXT is consistent. Mm -hmm. Consistent across the board. And as much as I'm a Bret Hart guy, I'm going to give my golden knocker to NXT. Ah, you join me. I'm so proud of you, Adam, because who the fuck NXT is, is the best wrestling show every week? They were rivaled for about two months with Collision, where that was the co-best show on TV. But you, you nailed it. NXT is nothing but consistency. They are constantly, everyone on that show has a storyline, has a purpose. The matches are fresh. You're watching these talent try new, interesting things. They take risks, whether they're good or bad. It just, it's, it's every week. It's, it's a joy to watch. I sit down. I enjoy watching it. It's the show that my thumb gets the most rest on because I barely fast forward. I fast forward almost nothing on NXT. Whereas on dynamite, I mean, especially with this continental shit classic, I, the fucking, I watched that show in fucking five minutes. Now SmackDown has been a pile of shit most of the year. Um, it's been good when Roman Reigns is around when he's not around, it, it's kind of lacking raw. Honestly, for me, if I were to rank the shows this year, I put NXT one. I put Raw number two because I think this is the best year Raw has had in a very long time. I think they've kind of found the formula with the three hours where it's just kind of like have some longer matches, especially with people that don't get featured as much. And I think it's helped round out their roster. I think they found a way. I think the Judgment Day has had a really good year in terms of backstage segments. People like The Miz kind of like like eating up time in a good way. Uh, my The third I'm probably going to give to Collision just because of the peak two months. That peak two months was enough to get it to three. And then I get to the fucking shit storm. I'll put SmackDown four. The dynamite, the D stands for dirt because that's where it belongs. That show fucking sucks. It is fucking miserable to watch every week. Like, what the fuck are we doing, Tony? Figure it out. Dynamite used to be must see. Now it's must fucking not watch. That show is shit. Worst brand of the year, AEW Dynamite. But NXT is getting a pair of knockers, right? Yeah, loving the gold knockers. Best heel. Christian Cage, Dominic Mysterio, Don Collis, Gunther. Now we are in the heat. This is my section. Get him off my TV. Get him off my TV. Get him off my TV. The best heel, the man that gets, or the woman that gets the best heat, that gets people upset, angry, and they're just despicable across the board. We have four, four in this category, and some of them stick out like a thumb. Some may have been arrested. Some might just be deplorable when it comes to being a father. And some just might be an old school end boss. They're very different in different ways. It's a beautiful category. It really is. And I look at this and I think, who do people boo the most? That's wow. what it comes down to me. <laughs> <laughs> there's like, there's two, in my opinion. But no, there's more to it than just there, There's three that get a substantial heat. Because like... Mean, Gunther gets heat, but not the level of heat the other three get because yes. there's enough respect for Gunther. The other three are actually like despicable characters. So for me, Gunther's out in that aspect of, of best heel. I, I think, sound, I think, I think that fun. Christian is deplorable in different ways. Dom has been just can't talk because they're booing him, booing him. And then there's Don Callis. Now I have a bias against Don Callis, the human thumb. I don't want him on my television. Not like Makes I a good hate heel. Him. No, no, I'm just saying. When he's on my television screen, it's either mute or fast forward. So to me, I don't care about him. It's a two horse race. It's Christian Cage and Dominic Mysterio because these guys have somehow created some type of visceral reaction somehow. You know, it's tough to go against Dirty Dom. You know, it really is. But there is one man that has really just been deplorable. It's tough. JC, where do you end up? This is a tough one for me as well, but as you were talking, just a fun little note. There was one wrestler that has crossed paths with both of these individuals. And one, he was kind of the catalyst for the turn. The other, he was the catalyst for more hatred. And that's Adam Copeland slash Edge. Dom turned on Edge in front of his father. That was Dom's turn. And then he goes to AEW. 
to see his buddy, best friend, Christian Cage, and he told him to go fuck himself. So, man, tough year for Edge and slash Adam Copeland uh, with the top heels. But, yeah, no, this is a two-horse race. You spelled it out perfectly. Callus is an incredible character heel. Like, he is just so fucking annoying, and you hate him. And But it just, like, he's it's not the level of what Dom and Christian are because they're actual superstars. They've been superstars that have been champions this year. They are superstars that, like you mentioned, get that visceral reaction. Dom, you can't even hear him speak, like you said. Christian, just fucking, he is the old school veteran, but the things that he says, the things that he does are as heel as they fucking come. And his fucking scowl is one of the best heel scowls of all time. It's one of the reasons I've always loved Christian is his facials. I've always been elite. But Dom has also entered the elite facial category in 2023. The growth we have seen from Dominic Mysterio and the ability to emote from that face baby has been top notch. His work alongside Mommy has been spectacular. This man was the best heel on Twitter on three different shows. He's been all over Raw, SmackDown, NXT, a star of PLEs, part of the main faction of 2023 in WWE, consistently week in and week out. Man, I, I came in. I, I might have voted for Christian in this category, TJ. I apologize, but I'm giving it to Dirty Dom because I just spelled it out and convinced myself. It's like this man has just... It is paralleled shows. And Christian, yes, he has been too, and he's amazing. But it just, I feel like this is Dom's award this year. Like, it, it maybe it's the fact that I think Christian's gotten a lot of love from us already, deservedly so. But it just feels like in terms of heel, you really have to judge it by the crowd. And the fucking crowd hates Dom. So Dominic Mysterio, you're getting my golden knocker. Another point about this that I definitely want to make is there's almost a level of you giggle when Christian's on television because you enjoy it. I don't enjoy Dom. I want to boo him. Like, you know what I mean? You, you I love, love both of them. So. No, but I just, to me, <laughs> I'm it's not like, a good person to ask this question. No, it's just but for, for me, it's like when you see Christian, you're like, oh God, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? You know, like you're kind of waiting for it. You're excited when you see Christian. Dom is just like, I, I want to punch this guy in the face regardless. If I saw him in the street, I want to punch him and his chicken nugget loving fucking head. But, <laughs> you know, I'm going to give it to Dom, my golden knocker, because of that alone. We're, we're looking at the person that is the worst human being in the world. To me, it's Dom. Head and shoulders above the rest. So the man served go. time, too, like you mentioned. Like, the guy served hard, legitimate time. Like, he's a, he's a hardened criminal. He is a bad guy. <laughs> Michael, hit us with another heat category, buddy. Most underutilized talent. AJ Styles. Huck. Kenny Omega, Wardlow. Nestlemania. Some people, you know, they tweeted us, they twatted us, they tweeted us, and they say, JC, you know what? He's underutilized on this program. <laughs> he only makes up 50%. He should probably make up 75%. And you know what, damn it? I agree. Most underutilized talent for the Jobber Knocker in 2023, 2022, 2021, 2020. When the fuck did we start this? From whenever we started, it's JC. But I'm not in this category because this is about wrestling. And there's a lot of wrestlers every year who go underutilized, whether it's because they have immense talent and experience, they don't really get the time, or they're a young upstart and hasn't really been given the shot, or they're just like, there's somebody that's just so good, they don't even know what to do with them. And I think a lot of the people on this list fit that. Um, obviously, I think AJ and Omega are kind of in the similar spot where they're two grizzled veterans, two phenomenal uh, singles wrestlers. And AJ, you know, he's kind of a part-timer now, so he comes and goes. But when he's been coming in 2023, Jesus, when he's been, he's been coming. coming up in 2023, I feel like he hasn't really done anything of importance. He just kind of shows up, does some stupid shit. He got his fucking bozos uh, back with him and a meet chin for, for fun, too. I feel like it just the underutilization is there for AJ. But when I look at Kenny Omega, I come on the show and I pound the fist because – we're going to get to him later in match of the year. He's half the fucking category for like singles matches. And by the way, those are like the only ones he had. But this motherfucker in singles matches is so fucking elite. And AEW is like, oh, no, stick him in a tag team. Stick him in a trio. Stick him in fucking like, like, what are we doing? Like that to me, that makes him underutilized. But then the other two like are kind of different. Wardlow obviously bursts onto the scene alongside MJF. He was this big powerhouse super over. He kind of had his moment where he got over him, and they just kind of like dropped the ball. He had a couple TNT title reigns, but they felt like they were nothing. And this year, up until recently, he hasn't really done much of anything. Now he's just cutting Miro promos in the back, which are great, believe me. And I think 2024 could be a big year for him, but 2023, definitely underutilized. And you look at Hook. I mean, this guy was a guy that captured everyone's attention immediately. And Nestlemania, what have they done with him since? 
almost nothing. So I'm curious your take on this award. For me, I'm probably going to give it to AJ or Kenny, but I think any of these four would be a good choice. Just want to stop you so you don't have a fucking conniption later. Uh, 2020, sorry, 2016 is when we started. So okay. it's been seven that's and a half of, years. That's a lot of fucking years of underutilization for me. Yeah, well, you've you've uh, you've done yeoman's work, as they always say. Uh, when I think of underutilized, I think not on my television. Somebody I want on my television. Kenny Omega was technically on my television, and you you've pounded your fist and you said exactly what I was hoping for when it came to I want him to be a single star, which makes sense. Which makes sense. But he's Kenny Omega. He's been on my television for most of it, right? Hook, I really enjoyed, but Hook's kind of in where he's supposed to be. So I don't necessarily really? think that, I don't think. To me, Hook's ceiling would be better in NXT or WWE. I, yeah, I don't. You don't think at this point he's been around what three years now that he should have like taken another step by now and been in more serious feuds and more like higher profile type things instead of just being like this token champion with his dad's title. He's incredibly young, and I don't see them using him in his full potential at all, ever. Wow. wow. So to me, that's not underutilized. That's just stupid booking. You know what I mean? Like, which would be underutilization technically. Well, I know, but I'm just saying, like, it's a little worse. It's a little egregious. So I'm not going to give it to him. Wardlow okay. is a real case of underutilized talent where you can see the guy do a fucking amazing swanton bomb, boom, and you're just like, dude's like 250 pounds. What is he doing? You know, like, like a brick shit house. And then there's AJ Styles, who was, you know, the, the quintessential phenomenal guy, but didn't do a lot and then came back and then left. And then, so for me, I'm looking at this as the two horse race, but to me, I'm talking myself into it already. I'm going to pick Wardlow because oh. I'm going to pick Wardlow because I look at Wardlow and I see what I'm looking for. You can look at him and go on a poster, on a cup, on a production truck, in a World fucking champion. Ev- you can yep. look at him and you can see it. And the fact that he's not even there and they've dropped the ball consistently with him, I think at least twice, if not three times, it seems like this year alone. That is more egregious to me than AJ Styles not being there. So for me, I want to see Wardlow, Big Daddy, Ward Daddy do something special. And maybe 2024, they'll flip the script on us. But that man is a world champion in his own right. And I think it's now or never with him. So that is my golden knocker for Wardlow because that man is a fucking train. Yeah, I think that's you raised the perfect points for him to be a pick for you because he is that young, like next generation type superstar you're looking for, face of the franchise type player. Whereas the two that I said I'm leaning for are people more on their back nine. But I'm going to give my award because I think you're right about him not being around. I think I have to give it to AJ Styles because I think that is a tiebreaker. Um, WWE apparently did not want none this year, but I want some. So. Um, hopefully, I mean, because look, we're in the twilight years, man. And I think with Omega, like him working hurt, I understood why he wasn't in as many singles injuries. We obviously saw he had the emergency, whatever thing that just happened to him. So he's going to be out a while and get some well-deserved rest. Hopefully when he comes back, we get some singles matches when he's healthy. But to me, I think I think you kind of narrowed it down for me with why my case had to be AJ. But I think your pick of Wardlow is perfectly picked as well. But either way, both these companies got to figure it out because they got a lot of talent that is being underutilized like me. Michael, hit us with another category, my fan. Left the Dolphin. What could have been? AEW Storytelling. Cody Rhodes finishing the story at WrestleMania. CM Punk staying in AEW. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn's tag title reign. We're leaping dolphins here on the Jobber Knocker. We personally don't leap the dolphin very often. Well, you do, but I don't. I've never left the dolphin in my life, but we watch a lot of wrestling, WrestleMania, and there's a lot of left the dolphin moments. Those what could have been, those missed opportunities, those things that kind of changed the entire direction of something. And obviously, like, look it. For me, there was one defining thing that set the tone for the entire year. And it was one that is with my most important guy, and that is Cody Rhodes not finishing the story at WrestleMania. That is going to be my golden knocker, without a doubt, runaway. But I do think the other categories on here are definitely worth discussing because this was a crazy year of 2023 with, like, we talked about it in moments. There were a lot of big moments. And moments come from either, like, capturing opportunities or missing opportunities. And the one on here, like, we look at, especially with, like, CM Punk, like, that was a missed opportunity that created a moment of the year. So it's kind of crazy how they kind of run parallel. And um, 
So I am curious uh, as we dive into this stuff, but to me, it's Cody Rhodes not finishing the story at WrestleMania because I think in every single thing you can look at in WWE that happened since then, for better or for worse, there I think it was a lot of worse in terms of like SmackDown and the Bloodline stuff and Roman Reigns was the decision to not do it then um, and making us wait hopefully till this year and they actually do it because if they don't do it again, good God, I'm out. See ya. But that to me, I think just completely set the tone for the entire year. And now here we are in December dealing with side quest Cody with fucking Shinsuke Nakamura and all this bullshit. And uh, me hoping that he's going to win a second straight rumble. But uh, uh, curious, what do you have here? Flipper, 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 faster than lightning. Sorry. When you said left the dolphin, that's all I could think about. Um, there are four in here that are absolutely amazing for different reasons. But I will say this. What do you say? What could have been AEW storytelling? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. What could have been? The guy writing's in a fucking tuts. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's true. You know what I mean? It's fucking terrible. Fucking awful. Get out of here with that nonsense. Cody Rhodes, you made, a, you made an absolutely A-plus case for Cody Rhodes. I do not have a problem with that pick at all. CM Punk, we'll talk about in a minute. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn's tag title reign. Mm. I do want to, I did want to see more of what was going to happen with these because I told you, watching them defend the titles in a TLC matches was all I wanted. I wanted fucking car wrecks. And it wasn't until we got the end of their reign with the fucking hockey jerseys and the fucking kabooms that was like they want they wanted to do that and then they fucking lost them. And I was so angry because I thought that would have been something. But to back to your point, that wouldn't have happened if it didn't happen without Cody somehow. There was some type of trickling in in that aspect of too. So to me, it comes down to Cody not winning and CM Punk in in AEW. So as much as I love the idea of Cody, I am interested in the idea of what CM Punk would have been in AEW because it you can compare apples to oranges where he came back in WWE versus he came back in AEW. It seemed like he was having more fun in AEW at the beginning, at least. Right. Oh yeah. But the, Everything but the, fresh is great. Right. You know, the honeymoon phase, but I will say this match strictly just from a money standpoint. CM Punk was the top merchandise seller. The tickets were going out of the fucking thing. They built a show around him. They, he could have literally pulled the fucking nose up on the plane single-handedly. He did. He did so pull I, the I, nose I, up. What I'm saying yeah. is like he could have even – they could have got an upward trajectory because of this guy. The machine with WWE goes no matter what, right? Like they're, they're, they're fucking – they're going. They can just plug and play. I'm sorry. Cody's, you know, not replaceable, but, I mean, they would find a way somehow someday. Yeah, that's how it works. But – AEW, think of the money they left on the table with CM Punk, Kenny Omega, CM Punk, Osprey. I can go down the line. CM Punk and anybody against the Young Bucks. CM Punk and Hangman again. CM Punk Swerve. You could, you could, Keith Lee. You could go down the fucking line. What they did, you know, they there was so much money left on the table, and him leaving was a seismic, just fucking blast to that company that I am sitting here wondering what if more than I am wondering what if Cody had won. So for me, I'm going to give my knocker to CM Punk staying in AEW because my wheels keep turning more and more and more thinking I would have fucking want to see that. I wanted to see this. I wanted to see that. What if AJ came back in AEW? You know what I mean? Like that would have been cool too, right? Like AJ Lee in AEW, that would have been awesome. I know you would hate a bit, but whatever. So that's they're true. not in that shitty division. The way we already talked about their booking and storytelling. I'm just Don't saying. Don't put my girl in that. Let her go to WWE in the Rumble. I'm just saying there's a lot of there's a lot of what if scenarios. They didn't do I, fucking Jack Perry versus CM Punk, which that I right mean, now no one wants fucking, to fucking no. no fucking, come on, just the promos Stop alone. It. Come on. Stop it. Knock it off. No. The the reason why for me it's just like this. Like obviously it's a left the dolphin because he was such a big star. They built the show around him, but. We had already kind of seen CM Punk and AEW for, what was it, a year and a half, almost two years. So we kind of saw what he did for the company. 
He built them up. He became the top merchandise seller. They built the show around him. So he kind of saw his impact. And obviously that was fresh. So over time, it would slowly decline. But you would hope since it raised that other people would be able to feed off his stardom. Like that was like putting him with Ricky Starks made a lot of sense because I think it did really help Ricky's stature uh, in the company and to the fans. But to me, like that's why it's it's obviously left the Dolphin because it was fucking insanely stupid how that all played out. And he's probably at fault. The fucking Alita at fault. Tony Khan's at fault. Jungle Boy's at fault. Every single person in the locker room is probably at fault. The fucking people who run that company besides Tony Khan who work with him and don't tell him no, they're at fault. But in terms of like the what the what could have been, it's like I kind of I kind of saw what it could have been. And it was great. And they ruined it. Whereas like Cody, I imagine if Brock Lesnar did that to him as the champion. Like, I, like everything like that I've seen and like the deterioration and the souring we had, the big the bigger part for me, it's almost less about Cody. It's more about like the kind of like impact the bloodline left because ever since Roman retained that, I feel like it's just been this fucking free fall for the bloodline and everything they've been involved in. Like the Uso stuff was good for a month, but I think we even agreed at the time. He, Roman didn't need the title to do that. In fact, he wasn't even defending it until he defended against Jay. It was just kind of like a bracelet he had on his show, uh, you know, just like a little, 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 little jewelry. It didn't mean anything. So that to me, like it's, it's a runaway for me. The CM Punk thing is very intriguing. If that didn't happen, I don't even know if we'd have other things nominated in this category, but obviously it did because I mean, you picked it for a reason. It is, it is deserving. I think any other year I'd be there with you, but to me, like this is my like let the dolphin, what could have been like, wrestling history this is a top like moment like that for me so it's an easy pick for me for just 2023 all right now michael get us to the next category get him off my tv the worst thing of 2023 award double j jeff jarrett texas chainsaw massacre death match tony khan ticket propaganda wwe women's tag division Get him off my TV, get him off my TV, get him off my TV. Let it out, baby. This is a vent session. <sighs> Worst thing ever in 2023 year of our Lord. Oh my God. You're going to sense a theme here, which is dog shit every single day of the week. But there are four that smell the dookiest of them all. <sighs> There's Jeff Jarrett. Just, just Jeff Jarrett. The minute he fucking showed up, he went on this list. And you know what? Everything he did since then made him fucking deserve to be on the list. That guy fucking sucks. So he was part of the Texas uh, Chainsaw Death Match. <laughs> that was probably uh, the worst segment of the year. Worst dumbest idea, dumbest everything. Synergy, though. Synergy. It's a $5 word. Synergy. Right? They got the guy paid for it. Admit shit. They got paid so of for course it. he's going to be part of shit. They 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 got paid, so that's a thing. Tony Khan, people can get paid for doing a lot of bad things. It doesn't mean it's right. Tony Khan's ticket propaganda to me is like whatever. Oh, you know, it it is what it is. We had this headache. amount of. To, it, to me, it's more of a child not just bending the knee and just saying I'm wrong. It just felt like this guy couldn't be told anything other than I am amazing and I've made history in wrestling. Whatever. It's annoying, but is it the worst thing? I don't know. Then the women's tag division in WWE. They were snake bit from the beginning. It was a rough road. I don't even remember. We said this, you know, on the last knocker that we did. I couldn't remember who Piper, well, at least Chelsea and Sonya won. I think it was, I thought it was against uh, uh, Shayna and Ronda, but I'm not, I don't think that was it. I, oh, it might have been, but no, they might have lost to someone else and then they right. beat them. I don't even remember either. You know what I mean? Like, it really was in shambles. It really was. Yeah. But Chelsea Green did a great job holding it down, and she became something that we really enjoyed. So to me, I would take that off the list. Interesting. Now, we're going into AEW territory with all three of these left. Jeff Jarrett is getting two of the three. <laughs> it seems logical. Jeff Jarrett as a whole, to me, he can't sucks. get it. He can't get it. Because there are there, to me, there is a redeeming quality of Jeff Jarrett. I think there is, at least somehow, some way. Even if the teeniest, tiniest bit. So it comes down to ticket propaganda or the death match thing. I'm going to go with the death match getting my golden knocker because I think in terms of it, it was everything I hate about wrestling and everything I love about it as well. So it just was like the perfect mix of God, this is awful, but I'm watching through my fingers. 
The ticket propaganda thing, I just want to forget. I just want to forget forever. Don't fucking poo-poo your great night of wrestling with this fucking bullshit. Between the CM Punk thing and the ticket thing, we all forget that you had an amazing event. You know what I mean? Like, shut the fuck up. But to me, that AEW... Well, Osprey will never forget it. They, yeah, well, yeah, he's an idiot for tattooing it. But that's the other point. The synergy just fucking exploded when I saw that. And I think, wasn't Jeff Hardy the other guy in that ring? It was, it was Jeff Jarrett versus Jeff Hardy. It was a battle of the Jeffs. Battle of the Jeffs with a fucking chainsaw fucking going around. I think that was, I don't know if it was Tony Khan or not, but that is that is a visual burned in my brain. Literally the worst segment of the year. I don't care what anybody says. And there was a championship involved. Oh God, I there was a fucking that. championship involved. If you have to fucking make up a championship, that's enough. That's enough for me to give it to you. What do you think I'm picking in this category? I'm curious. Oh, Jeff Jarrett. 100% Jeff Jarrett. You're wrong. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm I know I'm usually Jeff wrong. Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett sucks. He's terrible. But he's not the worst thing in 2023. And neither is that match. That match was terrible. It's fucking dog shit. But it wasn't the worst thing in 2023. The women's tag titles, like you said, they were Snake Britain. Can't really fault them. They weren't the worst thing in 2023. Then Tony Khan is fucking propaganda. He does these fucking promos with a fucking, we're selling tickets to a show fucking a year away. It's like, fuck off. You're an idiot. Not the worst thing in 2023. I'm going off the board here, Nessel. I'm calling an audible and I'm giving it to the Continental Classic because that thing is a steaming pile of shit. It sucks. It makes this show fucking terrible. It's fucking awful. You know what fucking the dynamite? The fucking the, the one with the last ones? They had a fucking 20 minute Mark Briscoe and Jay Lethal match. Those two fucking losers both had zeros. And I have to watch these fucking morons wrestle for 20 minutes. Somehow Jeff Jarrett wasn't a part of the Continental Classic, but his fucking teammate and buddy here, Jay Lethal, was. Worst thing of 2023. The Continental Classic, it sucks. It blows. Get it off my TV. I never want to see it again. Fucking Tony Khan having a fucking New Japan jerk-off session. You're a fucking loser, moron. Oh, and by the way, we have a fucking triple threat in one of the semifinals because his rules are fucking shitty. He's a fucking moron. This thing sucks. It's a waste of my time. It's actually actually saved me a lot of time because I fast-forward the fuck out of it. It doesn't even get 32 weeks. It gets the skip five, skip five, skip five. Because what's five times four in WrestleMania? It's fucking 20. And that's how long all these dog shit fucking matches are. It's fucking dumb. It's a reason why we laugh at your storytelling, you fucking stooge. Continental Classic, get it off my TV. I never want to see it again. I think this is a jobber knocker first going off the board. TJ's going to be pissed. I, I mean, pissed. look at and look at we came up with these. We finalized them a couple weeks ago. And I've been watching, fucking dealing with Dynamite. And it's like... How am I watching Dynamite in 10 minutes every week? Oh, wait, because it's a fucking a bunch of useless matches. Fucking Jay Lethal and Mark Briscoe in WrestleMania were both 0-4. And, and they had a 20-minute match. What the fuck? Put it on dark. And I know you don't have dark anymore, so don't fucking show it. Nobody cares. Good God. And they got a fucking This Is Awesome chant. Those fucking virgins in the crowd. Go take a shower and fucking, like, figure it out. You figure it out, you fucking losers. Absolute fucking losers cheering that match. Get the fuck out of my face. The, the the precedent that is good. the precedent that is now set in knocker awards history i mean it literally has to years, be something that happens after we finalize the nominations and this has mostly happened after that i cannot believe that is a the, the, a candidate out of nowhere i wasn't planning on doing it but as we were talking about it, i'm like man all these things sucked but you know what i hate more than all of them but don't <laughs> the you, fucking continental classic but don't you have recency bias against this though no because this thing i'm gonna hate forever because this is the epitome of why aew sucks a lot of the time the continental classic is the perfect representation wow i did not see that coming my jaw legitimately dropped because that was that was special that was special i think that's all we have for heat so uh yeah. michael got out of our system we got we got our visual reactions out of here. Michael, send us into a hopeful category, my friend. Newcomer slash acquisition of the year. Dragon Lee, NXT SmackDown. Lola Vice, NXT. Lyra Valkyria, NXT. Jay White, AEW. Nestlemania, what do we love on this program? New. Fresh meat! <laughs> Wearing my Meat Match of the Week t-shirt for the audio listeners. Um, I've referenced it several times today. But yeah, under my nice little jacket here. And Esselman and I both rocking the jackets this week. I decided to look a little presentable. Because we have a lot of newcomers. You got to look good for the newcomers. Because you only make one first impression. That's not true. Especially in wrestling. You can make a terrible first impression. Figure it out later and make a better one. <laughs> but I would say the four people on this list have made four incredible impressions in their new homes. Um, for many different reasons. Um, 
Obviously, NXT carries this award every year because it is literally the new talent of WWE. And there are three of them on this list. Um, one of them's actually already been called up, so good for him and Dragon Lee. But the lone AEW uh, nominee this year is Jay White. And I know both of us have been very hard on Jay White. We left a shit on him, especially, you know, kind of at the ire of our boys, Dom and Conway, who do our New Japan show. Um, kind of like to shit on him because, you know, it's just like, oh, this guy's whatever. But I will say this, WrestleMania, it, it was a little bit of a slow start in AEW. But the biggest beneficiary of all the CM Punk bullshit happening was Jay White. <clears throat> she was immediately elevated into the star of Collision. The Bane Bang Gang was getting more and more main events, TV time, plus level feuds. I mean, him and Juice had those fucking amazing matches with FTR. His character work, I think, was better than I expected it to be. I really enjoy the guns being added to his stable. I love when they bring out the fucking little stand-up cutout they have of Jay White. Um, and he's he's someone that I've been pleasantly surprised with because I didn't have high expectations because I've never been a Jay White guy. But I'm curious to see how he lines up for us against um, the NXT talent, which you look at Dragon Lee, obviously, in the rain. It's just an absolute blast. To watch the future of Lucha Libre and WWE feels like the passing of the torch from Rey Mysterio to him makes sense. And then we have two women nominated for many different re reasons. Uh, Lyra Valkyrie has been an absolutely stud. She's the champion now in NXT. She's someone that I had no idea who she was when they were running vignettes of her. But she is someone every time I watched her, I'm enthralled. Her wrestling ability is high level. I think her character work is coming around. I'm really enjoying her entrance. And I'm enjoying her as champion. But, you know, my girl Lola, they sign her. She's a fucking stud. Valerie Lareda, for those of you who don't know, fucking Bellator sensation, twerking sensation, absolute fucking firecracker. And you know what? She's picked up this wrestling thing pretty fast. From the date she got signed to the date she got in the ring, for someone who had never wrestled well before, was pretty unheard of. So she clearly is doing something right. She's the NXT breakout star of 2023. So, you know, good reason to have her on this list. But WrestleMania, who do you, who do you like in this award? What are you feeling? I think that Lola being in here is a crock of shit. Sorry. Um, I think you voted I with your penis. I think you voted with your penis. Oh, I did not vote for her. She's not my pick. But I think well, she, who I, would you put, I, well, a, who would you have put in here instead? You, uh, Hank I, Walker? Anyway. I know you're a big Hank Walker guy. I guess throw him in. Yeah, yeah Hank great. Walker. Fuck you know what's funny? I, so here's my other thing. When you said acquisition of the year, that you didn't put in Edge as, the, you know. Because he's, he's been acquisition. shitting AW. Everyone's I'm been just complaining saying, about him. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You're 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 treading different waters. Him and CM here. Punk have barely been around to do anything. That's he's an acquisition for WWE. yeah, but then, yeah, for like it's like a one. You're giving him an award for one week now. These people have been acquired for the entire year. Dragon. Yeah. So uh, to me, Lola Vice, night. Thanks for coming. Not even close for me. She's not even. You just want to swatch her walk out the door. You fucking pervert. No, That's I just don't want her in my fucking category. I don't want her. You can enjoy her shimmy shimmy yeah out out of the door. Sure, shake it. Now get out of my face. Anyway, moving on. Dragon Lee, amazing. Like you said, Lyra, I do like her. I think there's a lot of uh necessary things that need to change when she gets there, but again, she's a newcomer, right? This is the category or acquisition. Jay White, like you said, I thought he was overhyped. He gets to AW, kind of does what he can. I'm not a huge fan of Jay White. I think they kind of fucked them up big time with that, you know, that whole MJF entire run. It felt like they fucked them big time there. So I've I've a sour taste when it comes to Jay White. I might have voted for him, but I still have a sour taste for him. <laughs> this is why it's erroneous to vote, TJ. Don't let us vote. We'll just fucking do whatever we want. No, I like voting. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna. Who doesn't like fucking voting in polls? Like, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Polls. I'm gonna hold my hat in my hand and plead to God that Lucha Libre is built on this guy. I'm gonna give my golden knocker to Dragon Lee. Not a bad pick. Not my pick. I think I voted for Lyra. Um, I don't know. I just think she had. She really burst on the scene, and I, I like the thing I like about this category is it's someone that like surprises me because with Jay White, it's like everyone's been telling me how great he is. So. It obviously makes me a little skeptical, and he like he, I thought he did do better than I thought, but I I don't like you said it, it was it is kind of a sour taste. Um, so I do I do think I, I think Dragon Lee is a great pick because to come in had the impact you had for him and him already being called up and now he's a champion to close out 2023. That's a pretty fucking good resume. Um, but you know what, Nestlemania, this is a newcomer award, and uh, since you were fucking throwing shade, I'm just gonna give it to Lola Vice as a That's fuck bullshit. you. That's she bullshit. won. She won the breakout the breakout tournament, so that makes her a breakout star. So fuck you. Screw I'm man. giving her the award, and you're gonna have to deal with it. But it's only because you were so negative about it. You screwed Lyra out of award, and you made me give it to Lola. So 
Because you voted with your penis. You voted with your penis. I I did not. I just, I did this out of spite to you. This was a spite pick. I gave her a golden knocker out of spite. So she's not a deserving of this is what you're saying. Oh, no, she's very deserving. No, 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 because if she was deserving, you would have given it to her by herself. She is very deserving, but sometimes you got to come up with tiebreakers. And in this case, I can't put the spite one because you're a dick. Well, I am what I have. Anyway, let's move on to the next category. Michael. Best repackage. Braun Breaker. Heel. Kanosuke. Take Ishida. Callus. Family. Maxine. Alpha Academy. Tony Storm. Timeless. JC, I'm not a fan of the small package. I have a huge package, but we're talking about repackaging here. And I all think- right, well, okay, we're gonna no, 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 hold on. I know you're not a fan of a small package, mainly because you have one. So you're kind of upset that something that describes you is used as a move. Don't, don't say you have a big package. It's like we don't believe it. I don't come on here and say I have a big package. I, I come, I, I have a regular package. I'm not gonna come out here and lie. So don't go lie into the people messing with me. Medium package. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a medium package. It's medium. At a medium pace. So most people have. It's true. Anyway, (laughs) we're talking about repackaging because sometimes you need to just, you can only go as far as you possibly can as that kind of character. And then you decided, I'm going to go right when people think I'm going to go left. And you do a little bit of difference and it makes a difference. And I think these four specifically have me very enticed. And as I, I looked at this list, I thought to myself, this is a category that I could believe all four could win. And I love that. I love that these four are all, all deserving. And I we agree. we aren't grasping at straws here. So when I look at badass Braun Breaker, mm. that guy is main event anyway. We know it. But now he's got the confidence, right? And I think that character switch did something for him. Takeshita was really just kind of there. And then he joined the, the Don Callis family, beat Kenny Omega. I don't know if it was two or three times. I think it might've been three. That's a big deal. They're pushing him, pushing him, pushing him, pushing him, pushing him. He's got the erroneous giant Dr. Thumb with him. Great. Wonderful. Um, that's beside the point. Maxine went from models to a thank you and wrestling. So, and she's wearing a bra with a singlet. So a lot of people can't, uh, you know, <laughs> say anything bad about that. So it is what it is. And then timeless Tony Storm, as we talked mm. about. I mean, mm. you want to talk about reinvention. Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the accoutrements, the the et cetera, the gaga that comes along with her is just special. So, JC, I'm gonna I'm gonna whittle it down for me. Okay. Takesh, Takeshta, see ya, Dink. I not agree. in there. Fourth place. Thanks for coming. Braun Breaker, not a stretch for me. I'm gonna go between Maxine and Tony Storm for me. Mm-hmm. I'm curious how you feel about this. So I, I came to that same conclusion, for, but for different reasons. Uh, the Braun one, when it happened, like it was just something we were begging for with him. Because we get this a lot of times with these big baby faces. It's just like, man, let him cook as a heel. And he did. And it happened pretty early in 2023. And it was one of those things, like he did it. It's like, okay, he's main roster ready, but we're still waiting. So he's just kind of like this stuff with Von Wagner was a lot of fun. He's had a lot of good, like fun things in between. But And the repackage was amazing, but I don't feel like they've captured it as much as Maxine and Tony have because Maxine, it was just like instant. It was like the, the model stuff just fell apart. She did a great job with that, but it's just like, it was incredible how instant and seamless it was. Cause I would have never expected if before I saw it, if you told me, Oh yeah, they're going to stick Maxine with Otis and Gabe. I would have been like, what? But the first time I saw her with them as the hype and doing the thank you, the first segment we had of Chad Gable getting her like ready. I was just like, Oh my God. This, they, they fucking got something here. And not only have they got something, they've built on it, and it's gotten even better. And the same thing can be said about Tony Storm. I mean, this this woman has been a huge flop in AW, just pushed to the moon, given title reigns that nobody feels like she's deserved. And then all of a sudden, she loses the title, and it was the best thing to happen to her in her career because she becomes this cuckoo, goes into fucking noir land, and becomes timeless, and it's just like, wow, this gimmick. And now it's like, She's one of the best things on the show. So much so, they had to give her the title back. So for me, WrestleMania, I'm not giving a tie. I'm going to pick one eventually, but I agree. It's down to Maxi and Tony Storm, and it is a very tough one to pick. I don't think it's as tough as you think, though, JC. I'm going to go with the easiest pick in the world here, and it's timeless Tony Storm getting my golden okay. knocker because this woman has black and white. She's got Luther. She's got, you know, um, was her name? I, the, the new Mariah girl. May. Mariah May, excuse me for not knowing. That whole thing, 
Then she makes, she gets on commentary. She has backstage segments. To me, she is not just the best thing in the women's division. She might be the best thing on their programming period. Mm. Mm. So that's just, she's better to me. She's, I'm not, I can go a week or two without Maxine. I can't go a week or two without Tony Storm. Timeless Tony Storm anyway. Well, what I would say to that is, uh, thank you for coming with your take because I'm going to disagree. I'm going to give it to Maxine. That's bullshit. Like I said, this is a slight, it's a slight win, but I just, I was just blown away about how well this worked and I still enjoy them to this day. I look forward to what they do every week, which you don't always feel that way about like mid card type acts, but they're a lot of fun. And they've seamlessly snuck in Tozawa with them. And her, like, going out with Tozawa, like, this past week on Raw and stuff was great as well. So I think it's fair that both women deserve a knocker. So we'll split the knockers. Each woman gets one. I give mine to Maxine. You give yours to Tony. And everyone's happy. I'm not happy. You should have given her a set. Uh, no. They sure he has a set, you know? Just give her a single on the side. A little, little try after. You see what she said? Did you see what she said? She said, speaking of tits, here's Soraya. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> unbelievable she just she can't miss anyway fine i'll 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 bend the knee let's move on to the next category shall we yes sir comeback of the year carlito cm punk to wwe randy orton trish stratus don't call it a comeback they've been here for years nestlemania this is always a fun category every year because what is better in wrestling than a comeback and we certainly had a lot this year. So many so that your girl Nia Jax got bumped off this list. I will say, in the Royal Rumble when she returned, a little joke between me and TJ, I threw Nia Jax on the list, and he immediately texted me. So, you know, just what, little, what, little... what did he say? What did he say? He, he just said, LOL. And I knew okay. what he was saying. It just like, it just, it's, it was one of those things. And, and, and honestly, she lasted on this list because then she actually made an impact later in the year when she actually started working. But I mean, since then, We've had some insane comebacks. And now you're looking at this list and the earliest one we had, because the three of these are for later in the year. Well, Carlito, I guess, was early, but he, much like Nia Jax, didn't come back again for a while. But Trish Stratus was the one who had come back from the long-term break, was on TV every week, was going up against one of the major superstars in big spots week in and week out. And it was like, oh, my God, as much as we have not enjoyed this, we could possibly get to the end of the year and she could be a serious contender for this award, but ah, ah, throw her out baby, because we got three other guys strapping lads while two strapping one punky coming through that door. Um, look at, I've been ready to give this award to Carlito forever. Cause Nestle, I mean, I come on our fucking rumble episode every year. And what am I hoping for him to spit in the face of somebody who thinks they are cool. And when that happened in Puerto Rico, his return, that was fucking awesome and he looked great he looked fucking phenomenal gas to the gills and he obviously has come back didn't do a lot kind of had santos now rewrote him off tv so like my heart wants to give the award to carlito but that's not where it's going so throw him out randy orton's story incredible the guy comes back from fusion back surgery this soon and looks like he does him and carlito must have been working out together Probably brought AJ Styles with them too, because these dudes are gas to the gills. The sauce is back in the E, and we're all better for it. But obviously, Survivor Series, we knew it was coming. They play with our hearts a little, but he comes back. He looks great. Randy's happy. Randy's going right for Roman right away. We love Randy Orton on this program. He is an absolute stud, but he's not getting it either. Because this one, the minute that CM Punk came back, it was over for everyone else. Cause this has been 10 years in the making. This is like the biggest, re- like this is like the biggest return we have been waiting for. This guy has had people chanting his name at shows that he was never going to show up at forever. And finally, Nestlemania, it might be John Cena's gimmick to never give up, but we as fans, we never gave up because CM Punk came back and he's the easy pick for me for comeback of the year. The fact that Trish Stratus is on here and Nia Jax isn't is a fucking joke. I would just yeah, say this much. Not even remotely true. You can't, no, no. One of the if, biggest legends of all time who came back to be a full-time wrestler. Nia Jax is one of the most disliked wrestlers of all time who wasn't gone that long and came back. Trish Stratus, Trish Stratus had one of the worst years in this entire, with the exception of the last match she had, everything was a fucking banana peel to me. It was fucking trash. It was trash Stratus is what it was. 
All right, that's what she yeah, was. Yeah, she came in fourth, but she's better than Nia Jax. Mm, I don't know about that. But anyway, moving on. Carlito, yeah, thanks for coming. You're yoked. Whatever. It's, it is what Fuck it is. You. It's cool. Give him more respect than that. No, I know. I don't need to. I don't need to. I, I, I do. Your see... thing. I wish I had an app right now. I spit in my computer. Yeah, but then you'd only be harming your computer. Yeah, I know. It's bullshit. Program. Yeah, it's God. bullshit. It's bullshit. Um, Randy Orton, yoked, as, as we said. Uh, can't wait to see him, but it was only 18 months for the comeback. You said 10 only years. 18 months, only 18 months. Only 18 months. Yeah. For a comeback. No sweat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuck May never story. come back from a career ending injury. It's whatever. But CM Punk, like you said, 10 years, never thought it was going to fucking happen. All these other people, you could see it fucking happening. This was fucking banana land. Holy shit, it fucking happened. So for me, I'm giving it to Phil Brooks, CM Punk, returning to WWE because that golden knocker is shining up real nice. That man's getting multiple sets. He's a chick magnet. The end of story. Well, WrestleMania. We gotta toss the Nike, uh, Michael again because he's gonna finish us off much like you did yourself when Nia Jax returned. Match of the year: Will Ospreay versus Kenny Omega, Wrestle Kingdom 17. Bad Bunny versus Damian Priest, Street Fight, Backlash. Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay, Forbidden Door. Carmelo Hayes versus Ilya Dragunov. NXT Great American Bash. We are in the home stretch, Nestlemania. Two categories to go. Two big ones. Because we're in the finish. Which means it's almost closing time for 2023 on the Jobber Knockers. So keep your peepers popped and enjoy this last little bit here of JC and Nestlemania as we get ready for 2024. But we have to look back at the... It's called wrestling. So, I mean, the entering work has to count for something, right? And we had some fucking banners this year. Much like every year. TJ and I had about 12 on this list. We had the staff get together, pick their favorite four, aggregated it out, and these are the four we came up with. And you'll look at Nestlemania. I don't know if this has ever happened before, but we have the same match twice between two individuals. Number one at Wrestle Kingdom for Osprey and Omega, and the second one at Forbidden Door. Both made the top four of our matches of the year. And uh, honestly, they might be my top two matches of the year. My third one actually didn't make it to this round. Um, surprisingly, shout out Ray and Dominic at WrestleMania. That one was fucking awesome to me for so many reasons, but I still don't think it would have won. So I'm not that mad, but I will say my, the most surprising match of the year for me was bad bunny and Damian priest. Cause we didn't know what to think, especially in the main event, obviously the crowd, the atmosphere, that bad bunny entrance was one of the all time entrances of all time ever, ever, ever in the reception he got in the match fucking delivered. This was probably the best Damian Priest ever looked, but also Bad Bunny to do what he did, to be someone who just has wrestled only a few times, to have that kind of masterpiece. I'm glad they made it to this round. They're not winning. And then the other one, Dragunov and uh, Carmelo, they were nominated for Rivalry of the Year, mainly for their entering work. It was top notch. These guys were great, but it's number four for me. I, my top two is Omega and Osprey. I just have to decide which one. That's an interesting take. I will say that much. Uh, Bad Bunny, I'm not going to give him my golden knocker because I just won't. Because honestly, uh, he was a moment maker. He's not a matchmaker. I don't think the match hands up uh, stands up as much as the actual wrestling. The uh, best matches have moments. No, I know. I'm just saying that's fair. That's fair. But from bell to bell, I don't remember it as much as the moments. I, like you know what I mean. Like I'll remember more of the other things that went on here. Carmelo Hayes and and, and Elia, I love them. I love that Elia did a great job with this entire feud. He's amazing, and obviously I'm, I'm a mellow guy from way back, but they're not. They're my number three. So it does come down to Osprey and Omega. It comes down to Osprey and Omega. And I'm wondering your thoughts on this because to me it's it's almost like, if I remember correctly, the Forbidden Door one was when Osprey finally beat Omega. Is that correct? And that's the one to me that – with the lead up of it on AEW and the whole thing that they did made me feel like that was the most important because that was the mountain to climb. That was the mountain to get over the hump, everything for Osprey to solidify himself as a big fucking deal. Cause we, we were kind of skeptical when we first saw him and now we think like the world of this dude and he's an amazing human. So I'm going to go with the forbidden door Osprey and Omega because it made Osprey that bigger than he needed to be. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to see where he goes going forward now that he got over the hump. Yeah, this, to me, normally, in these type of situations, I almost always to default to number one. Because the first time I see it, it's the freshest, it's the newest, it's the first time I'm seeing these types of things. 
It's so rare that we get to a rematch where I think it was better. But this is the scenario here. I thought the rematch was better. It was the atmosphere was awesome. I thought Osprey leveled up. Obviously, like these two guys are two of the best in the world. Most people know that the casuals, not as much. They probably haven't seen it. But I think this was like you mentioned, the Will Osprey coming up party when people really realize like this guy is the, like one of the future pillars of this industry. He is fucking incredible. It, I won't so much say passing the torch because Kenny Omega has a lot left in the tank. But in terms of like a prime guy passing his prime to the next guy, it felt like it could be that. And to me, it, it was it, it was one of those things where they had callbacks to the first ones but they had so much new stuff mixed in. And that's always my big thing in rematches. It's like, how can you do it differently to make me really love it? And they fucking nailed it. Like these two guys, chemistry, all time chemistry. I can't wait for when we get to see number three someday when Kenny Omega is healthy and Tony Khan decides to book singles matches. Cause by the way, 2024, Will Ospreay's head to AEW. He's going to, they're going to finish up in new Japan, but I believe February, March ish sometime there. Will Ospreay is going to be full-time at AEW. So that's going to be very interesting. But yeah, match number two, Forbidden Door. Getting a set of golden knockers from us. Match of the year. Jobber of the year. Giovanni Vinci. The Miz. Omos. Zelina Vega. What's up, jobbers? It's the most important one mm. of the year. This is our main event. We are the jobber knocker, our namesake for crying out loud. People think when they hear the jobber knocker that we're making fun of jobbers, but we are not. This is why it's our main event because you need enhancements. You need people to lose. And so, honestly, people who lose very well and they do it in style. And we have four people as we've done this. It's been kind of back and forth who should be here, who shouldn't be here. Who takes a lot of L's? Who takes a lot of L's? I will say this much. Thank God I put in the hashtag jobber alert because I went back and told you guys how many had what, whatever, whatever, because there is a long laundry list of people who have lost this year. But we had to whittle it down to four. And this is a big deal. This is the big one. This is the huge one. This is the Super Bowl for the jobber knocker here. Giovanni Vinci, who has been the fucking toad of the group, so to speak. The Miz, who was on a phenomenal losing streak for a mm. very long time. Mm. Omas, which was the jobber to the stars, really. And Zelina Vega, who unfortunately, as wonderful as she is, I'm sure, was just kind of there to get beaten up a lot of the time. She did, however, have a great match against Rhea Ripley, but did have a losing effort there. So I'm curious, JC where you stand on this because we we think differently when it comes to jobber enhancement stuff yeah this is the, the one reason why i think we both love this category is for it's kind of a choose your own adventure like the definition of jobber especially how we leave it on this program it's purposely vague like it's easy to look at the statistics and that is a big part of it someone who loses all the time someone who loses fast all the time that is your quintessential jobber but you look at this list and you're like man the miz and omas the miz is one of the most accomplished superstars of all time but it's not just his losing streak of the reason why he's here. He's someone it's felt like has been kind of like just constantly getting put down. And even in the Gunther feud where he looked great, it felt like it was just like he was supposed to be a walkover. You know what I mean? That's the way Gunther was treating him, like not taking him seriously. That can also be someone who is like a jobber. It's someone you're not taking seriously. Someone you should run through. Someone that should just quickly get you going. And then Omas, it's crazy that he's here. But we've seen this guy just come back to lose this year. It just it's one of those things like they haven't used him a lot, especially down the stretch, but he got a lot of usage early in the year and he literally came back just to lose to people and have a guy that big be put in this category is crazy, but it works. But to me, this came down to a two horse race. Zelina Vega is the statistics winner for sure of the year. And in the women's division, by far, she was the plug and play woman to go out there. She had a lot of opportunities, but she lost them all. Um, she's someone who consistently on SmackDown is on the losing side to a very heel dominant show. Deserves to be here, not my winner. Omas, not enough meat on the bone for me to give it to him. Um, it's a unique sense, but I, the reason, again, why I love this category is you have four people for four different reasons. Came down to Geo and The Miz. And, you know, I kind of had this award pegged for The Miz all year because it's 2023 really felt like it was one of those. He got the redemption towards the end in terms of appreciation. But it felt like between the Loomis stuff and all the nonsense he had been through, it felt like it just like, man, Miz has just gone. He's just been like giving this year. He has been a giver, which is what a jobber can be. But you kind of like lightened us up to Gio Vinci. 
And I really thought about it. And I was like, man, obviously Gunther, dominant. Ludwig, breakout year for him. We see him as a future single star now. But that always means the other guy. Not saying you're getting genetted, but you're getting that treatment. Like, you're the one taking the losses in the match. He was the one getting the ire of Gunther for most of the year, so much so that Ludwig was put in charge of him. He was, the Miz even made fun of him in that segment. Like, oh my God, he talked? That's another big thing. Gio's barely allowed to talk. He's taking L's, so he's going to be my winner. In a wow. massive comeback to 2023, he caught up to the Miz, because whereas the Miz rose at the end, Gio continued to be the punching bag at the bottom, partly because of the Miz. They were neck and neck, and Miz got the haymaker in before he went and got slapped the shit out of by Gunther two times. But Giovanni Vinci, Vinci, Jesus, my boy, the smiling perfection, one of my favorite NXT gimmicks ever. He's getting my golden knocker for 2023, jobber of the year. So you do say something along the lines of this is a choose your own adventure, and I definitely agree with that because there's, there's, I could be convinced of all of these. Uh, you know, Brock and Omos at WrestleMania. Mm. That's mm. a big, that's a big dumping of a, of a jobber right there. You know what I mean? He was just there mm -hmm. to fucking eat it and that's fine. But again, he disappears, right? He only comes out. He's like Sasquatch comes out when he wants, you know, whenever he fucking wants a sandwich or something. Then there's Selena Vega. As much as I love her, I'm thinking, mm, I don't remember her dropping. Like she did, right? Like a lot. it was like a, a lot. <laughs> But it was just like, I don't, she didn't make an impact when she lost, if that makes any sense. I don't know. I just, I feel like it was just like filler when I watch her, which is whatever. So it does come down to Gio and the Miz for me. And as you made an excellent point about Giovanni Vinci, all I kept thinking was this was the year. This was the fucking year that the Miz wasn't on WrestleMania as a wrestler. He mm. was the host of WrestleMania. Mm. And not only that, in two nights, two fucking nights, he had to fucking lose to Pat McAfee. Mm. And then Shane McMahon's fucking mm. quad. And then fucking Snoop Dogg. You want to talk about a knockout punch? Yep. He jobbed on the biggest stage of them all in glorious fashion. And did it with a smile. And to spin it in a positive way, he can lose as much as humanly possible and still be the fucking Miz. And to me, that is an absolutely wonderful story that I'm going to give the Miz my golden knocker for jobber of the year in a positive mental attitude that I have because that man does a lot of good for a lot of people. So that's where I'm going to leave it. I like it. As you know, The Miz is one of my all-time favorites. Always has been, always will be. And part of it is for this reason, because he's not afraid to look like a fucking asshole. He's not afraid to make other people really look good in spite of himself. And that is what we're asking for in The Perfect Jobber. In The Miz, he is the one of the most successful Perfect Jobbers of all time. Hall of Fame resume as a superstar, Hall of Fame resume as a jobber. Well, folks, this is the end of the Knocker Awards. We hope you enjoyed it. This is one of our favorite shows of the year. Mm. want to give a special shout out to JC and TJ for accumulating over the year because that is a not fun task. It is a lot of work. And those two go back and forth all year round. I don't even get to see the list until about November, December. It's better that way. You Probably. come in and you, you help us. You help us kind of like get the categories to where they need to be. We always have a good base. But there's always a few categories where we're like, we really need the Nestle, like little, little, little <laughs> spritzel. The Nestle the little magic? The, no, the Nestle I'm, not, magic. I'm not giving you magic. Nestle you, magic, yes. The Nestle, the Nestle, Nestle spritzel. No, Nestle magic. Yeah, yes, there, ain't, right. there ain't no magic in you, baby. Oh, come on. There's a little bit of magic when I when I come on the show. It's fine. Uh, anyway, I want to give a special shout out to everybody, especially Michael Downing for lending his golden pipes mm. as usual. Michael, you make this thing sing in so many more ways than I can even imagine as well as the rest of the Jobber Knocker staff. But thank you to the fans that continue to support us in every single way. Go to tpublic.com slash Jobber Knocker to pick up some awesome teas like JC's Meat Match of the Week. Or if you want to get cursed by me, ooh, <laughs> go get an Nestle Curse Tea. And anyway, we got a lot of mouths to feed on this program, so help us out when you can. On that note, thank you for listening to the Jobber Knocker. We'll be back next year, 2024, big year for the Knocker. We'll see you next time on the Jobber Knocker. Yeah.